I have beat everybody into the call. The background is the landscape from Seoul. There's John. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Same here. Uh, we got the, uh, I don't know how we, is it just us? <laughs> um, we're early, so it's uh, oh. just us so far. Okay, well, I, great to see you in any case. And at some point, uh, we should have a, a one to one. I like that. That'd be good. And there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff cooking. Yeah, uh, there's so much stuff cooking. I have four million tabs open that I've got to sort of filter. Yeah, I have the same feel. I have the same feeling. And, yeah. and uh, pretty amazing. Right. Right. Yeah. Somebody. Some. Uh, one of the tweets I just retweeted this morning. Uh, was basically pulling up the old uh, German magazine covers uh, from both Stern and Spiegel. And Stern is kind of more, you know, People magazine, but people, but you know, Spiegel is their serious business magazine. Yeah. And, you know, as soon as Trump was elected, they had covers on it about his fascism. Yeah, they were uh, right on top. Understandably, of uh, <laughs> understandably uh, early in their. <laughs> awareness of that yeah 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 like oh. oh we were aware but we were embarrassed about we said oh no that's we don't want to say that <laughs> we you know well it was actually actively suppressed i mean it's like you couldn't really yeah. call it out because like no he's not no give him a good chance just a business guy right anyway. um mike awesome greetings has does anybody recognize my background i was going to ask uh, wow! It, it it is it from a a, a science fiction story? No, no not really sci-fi. Ah. is okay. it a painting? A painting, not a pic, not a photograph. No, it's a it's a it's an image from a movie. Oh, Xanadu? pardon? Xanadu. I never saw the movie, but I'm gonna guess. <laughs> nope, nope, but good guess. The background we're guessing. <laughs> Everybody don't watch enough movies. <laughs> it's a it's a new movie, so probably you haven't watched it. I highly recommend it. We're not done watching it actually. We've only gone halfway through. Is it soul? Um, yes. So this is kind of the Vardo. This is this is where uh, where we go after we die, kind of, or at least it's Pete Doctor's image of that. It's What's kind of a Vardo kind of pardon. What's the name of the movie? I didn't hear. Soul. Soul. Yep, it's a new Pixar movie. Oh. Um, and Pete Doctor. Uh, who has, he did Inside Out. I think he did Big. He mm -hmm. did a whole bunch of, of like really important um, it's the... Pixar movies. Yeah. And he really has this gigantic imagination for figuring <laughs> out like what what happens and, 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 and how our lives work and how emotions work and all of that kind of stuff. It's really it's like, this is an important sort of work that, that cartooning and animation can do. Did he do Coco too? I think he did. Yeah, he Coco did. was fantastic in terms of the imagery of the bridge between the worlds and the, the constant dissolving and, you know, it's really stellar work. Yeah, here's uh, interesting. I've only, yeah. He actually sort of had the idea for Soul, so he not only produced it, he also did Monsters, Inc. Um, so there we are. Hey, welcome to the OGM check-in call for Thursday, January 14th, 2021, which has started off with a bang, one has to say. <laughs> um, bang? <laughs> I, uh, several bangs, actually, sort of, in different ways. Um, Hey, Kevin, or just, just wandering in uh, to say hi. Um, I was happy to see the, the uh, second impeachment. Uh, it certainly puts a nice footnote on Trump's record. <laughs> I'm very bummed that uh, McConnell and isn't going to join everybody in calling a, an emergency session of the Senate so that they can actually convict. Cause that would certainly send a sign. I would have thought there'd be some provision for that being done without McConnell by some cluster of other people. 
apparently the the calling of an emergency session has to be bipartisan has to be like the the leaders of both both house both sides of the senate i see both parties that's i guess the rule uh, george did you want to jump in no i just you're just saying, saying yeah <laughs> cool it's just Love the Schwarzenegger movie if you, or, or video if you haven't seen it. It's just yeah, yeah. hilarious. It's very good. And, and slight plot spoiler on it. There's, you know, you see his face and then they do a second shot from over here and a third shot from over here. And when you see the second shot, you're like, his hand is on something. And it's like, and at the beginning, I'm like, and the second time they do it, I'm like, his hand is on like a katana, like a Japanese sword or something. And then it's like, oh no, wait a minute. And then he brings up, Conan's sword. So, a good prop. I mean, not everybody gets to pull out Conan's sword and that's for sure. Be taken and then seriously. he says, "We'll be back." Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Rosalie, brilliant. Oh no, it's not Rosalie. It's Kevin who's uh, muted. Uh, Rosalie but with a beard. Rosalie's account. Kevin, if we if you're talking to us, we can't hear you. On the laptop, I'm Rosalie. I, I need to go change that it, and make it me. Excellent. Or you could just do a little like makeup and stuff and try to pretend yeah, like you're Rosalie. Yeah, uh, it's it's. I don't think that would play well at home. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, cool. So let's. Um, yeah. The, thanks, Klaus, for the the Schwarzenegger um, video. So, and in the back of my head. I'm thinking or wishing that more of what we're up to existed in the world so that the stories of, hey, is this fascism or insurrection or a coup or what, and, and other kinds of stories that are happening could be visualized, told, memorialized, mapped, uh, shared out, analyzed, experimented with in better ways, given that we have, you know, the intertubes and some new technologies in the world. Um, but we're not. I mean, this is basically I'm uh, last the last week, the last year, the last decade, I've been scrolling between web pages and tweets and and what and videos and whatnot. So so we're kind of stuck there. So why don't we do a go ahead? Can I ask you a question like where are you at with the software of OGM, if that's a possible brief answer? <laughs> um, it's a medium length answer, Eric, but thanks for asking. So so OGM isn't seeking to build a new software platform like the next LinkedIn or the next brain but rather to create an environment within which a variety of tools are much more open, if not completely open source and more interoperable and can share reliable data and uh, encourage storytelling and discourse uh, and better decision-making and all those things. So, so uh, we're sort of trying to figure out how do we encourage a lot of these tools to, to talk to each other uh, and to be available so that people who want to explain, experiment, share what they know, curate, uh, can do so together. Because right now, every tool's kind of got its own little data silo, and the tools are really quite different one from the other. Um, some of the tools are valuable and others are not so valuable. So um, anybody else want to take a swing at the answer? Uh, and, and one last thing I'll add, which is there's a sub-project of OGM called Free Jerry's Brain, which is um, trying to take an extract of my data and put it in uh, in the world so that we can experiment with it. And we're actually getting really close to that. Um, so, I, yeah, I also yeah. know a developer who hacked the database. I have to remind me talk, talking to you about it. Which database? Yeah, probably you did it as well already. But um, I know someone who actually, uh, yeah, re reverse engineered the, the brain database. Oh, OK, cool. Let's have that conversation. Um, anybody else want to add something about the status of our platform-ish thing? Pete, did I do OK? All right. Um, good. So let's do a let's do a check in and let's go. Uh, Kevin, I know you only have a half hour these days because you have a standing call. So let's go, Kevin Scott George. Okay. And I, it's only every other Thursday that I have half an hour, so I have a regular. <laughs> okay. I will, you know, I've been mentioning this community equity fund, which is friends and family funding for Black and Brown entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle, and we got a. A, a, the Episcopal Diocese here in, in Western North Carolina said we would put up, they would put up 25,000 if uh, we, they get a letter from the hospital foundation that they really would put out 100 if there's a match. And, 
asking for that letter caused the hundred to flow. So suddenly we have 130,000 and we're talking to banks saying, well, if the hospital's there. And so anyway, getting a lot of momentum and getting some really interesting faith-based, uh, we, we can create, you know, what, uh, what we're calling a perpetual mission fund through this kind of thing for churches where you, you give, you invest in black businesses, and then over time the money comes back and then you designate it for local good. So it's anyway, a lot of really cool momentum happening there. And, uh, that's the, that's the simplest thing. So, yeah. I like that, Kevin. Um, a question I, sh I should be asking more often. Um, is there any way that OGM could be helpful to that initiative? Like to tell the stories better, to memorialize and share the results or the, the questions or anything like yeah. that? Yeah, well, so yeah, we are setting up a series of uh, four group webinars that we're gonna do three a month. Uh, one is for college students, local college students here. Uh, one is for faith-based groups. One is for chamber and um, public sector folks. And so we can, we'll talk about increased sales tax, increased property tax values, increased wages, increased jobs, you know, all those, all those things because they like to measure quantifiable economic growth. And we can show that folks who don't have money, if they get assets, grow all those things that they measure. Uh, and so that's one thing. Then we've got one for uh, banks and philanthropic institutions. And, and then, uh, is that four? I think Public. that was four. Yeah, so, so that's what we're doing. We're, we're working on the, the, the customizing the decks to, you know, to show growth to city and chamber folks and to show why you're connected to folks that you wanna be connected to across race and class for people of faith and kids to talk about, you know, this, look at the future, invest in the future that, that you're part of and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, and then the institutional, which will be, you know, that stuff you do to institutions. So as those work out, I'd love to, anybody who wants to, to be in a, a, you know, some kind of a viewing group around, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't ask this group to go into the faith-based messaging, but maybe the public sector messaging or the, the college student uh, messaging might be interesting. Uh, because we think it, and we're, we're getting it replicated in a couple of places because it's, it's really just, it's much more like STP than it is like an oil refinery. Like, you know, it, it, it adds to folks who already have loan funds because it goes down to where the loan funds don't get the money out that everybody's realizing the problem. And we went into Chicago, both Kellogg uh, Business School and uh, Axion, the accelerator said they were about to create a thing like that. And I'd been working on it longer because I realized the problem about six years ago, and this this is a better version. So it's starting to replicate, <clears throat> and so we'll figure out other things. But yeah, people could uh, the more uh, you know the message to students and the message to the, the you know the chamber and public sector worlds that that would be really useful because we you know we, we're just figuring those things out. Don't know. Cool. I'm Matt. Yeah, should be a few weeks. Yeah. Kevin, maybe just to connect the dot on, um, and maybe this will be my update, Jerry. One of the um, one of the conversations that I'm having right now is with Mes Western Michigan University, hmm. um, and their um, and a small group within their business school, hmm. um, and they they've actually created this really interesting model where they they basically turned their program into a consulting program. So they send their students out into the field where they provide consulting services at minimal rates to different local businesses. Um, uh -huh. And then, but one of the things they've done is they built up, I think it's a $50 million fund yeah. where they are buying businesses and then yeah. their graduates are taking over the management of those businesses. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're learning how to run these things, but I think maybe there's a connection here around what types of investments that this fund makes and how they do it and all that kind of stuff. So maybe. Yeah, I'd it, love to. Yeah, I'm talking to the guy tomorrow. So, okay. um, um, and so I don't know where this fits, but one of the things that I was thinking about bringing to this group of OGM is convincing them that they can, um, they can, you know, uh, exponentially grow their advisors, their teachers, their mentors for these people by tapping into, you know, this OGM community. So they're not only getting education from kind of classic corporate businesses, yeah, right. but they're also getting 
you know, um, thinking about business 2.0 or the 21st century organizations. And Doug, I was thinking about you as well around, can we talk about, you know, sort of these garden communities and, cause that's what they're trying to do. Kalamazoo is a really a hotbed for being its own garden community. They're, they're investing a ton of money. They've created this thing called the Kalamazoo Promise where if you graduate from a high school, um, Kalamazoo high schools, they'll pay for your college education. There's a lot of social money going on and it may be a good community, Kevin, to get you linked into, so. That'd be great. <clears throat> well, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this gap is that the people creating funds don't see it because they don't have it. I was doing a call with a group at Duke uh, Business School and they're doing the capital stack, which is, you know, big project finance to private equity to venture to seed to, and then down to friends and family. I said, well, what if they don't have a rich uncle or rich aunt? And this Duke student looked at me for a minute like, not have a rich uncle, not have a rich aunt. And so the people building the funds don't realize that this actually has to be an asset class because the folks I started working with where I saw it six years ago, I was working with two you know, um, African-American accelerators and we said, let's do Kiva. And none of, nobody could do it because nobody had uh, 25 friends with $25 uh, of any of the 50 people. And so it was this gap. And it was like, they have friends and family, but they don't have friends and family that 25 people have $25. So then working on institutionalizing that. But it's a really, it's a blind spot for all of the fund managers because they, fund managers come from good schools and have networks with people with money, which is why you have a fund manager. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a really, it's, the, the Duke guys are like, Took him like 30 seconds to think, realize what world would that be in? You know, I was like, it's not a Duke business school world. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, it took him a minute, you know? So it's, it, so they're building these loan funds and then they don't know why the money didn't go out the door because people aren't ready for that. They, they don't have that friends and family to get them ready. So anyway. I'd Is love like a landing page, Kevin? No, it's actually uh, equity and revenue share, which I can go into and send you a deck or whatever you email me. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it, nobody needs any more debt. It, this, this is uh, patient capital equity revenue share. Uh, okay. Thanks. Pooled income fund is the structure. I'd love to wrap sort of an OGME uh, wrapper around what this, co this conversation so far, which is um, I think one of the best things we could do for the country is to sort of go into the country and try to fix what's broken. And it would be really interesting as an OGM project to create a field manual, a handbook, a toolkit, uh, whatever it might be um, that helps people. So, so the school that you're working with, Matt, is doing a cool thing. Describe it and replicate it. Like, like make it really, really easy for anybody who's trying to fix things to go, oh, okay, we go talk to the school, we go do this, we go do that. And then here are the kinds of things we can bring up. And then here are the kinds of programs we can institute to create a, a, a step into the economic system and, and so on and so forth. And this is you know, nonpartisan, uh, but it could be full of really interesting ideas and stories to tell. And then part of the thing is, what is the framework where you can discover what the options are how do you connect with other people in these sort of different networks and sub-networks? And then how, if, you, if you want to do this thing you just heard the story of, how do you then go implement it? Like, yeah, uh, I think this is why we need a questing, questing architecture infrastructure. Yeah. Right? How do you quest? How do you codify your quest? How do you scale your quest? How do you, you know, create the replication and all that kind of stuff? So uh, I feel like that's a priority from an from a infrastructure standpoint for us. Um, agreed. I totally agree. Uh, Doug, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I'm just thinking that if we did a project that involved a community, uh, we amongst ourselves would divide quickly. For example, whether we are looking at the project in the context of capitalism or uh, outside of capitalism. And I don't think we've had that discussion. So it would be fascinating, but it might be really difficult. Uh, it, to take on a concrete project. Klaus? Yeah, this is, <clears throat> this would be a wonderful discussion because what we really want is capitalism operating in fair and well-regulated secure markets, right? I mean, that's that's uh, the fastest way to get, to get anything done, really, to incentivize people um, and, and let them go for it within a regulatory frame that keeps the direction. So I will submit that when you said what we really want at the beginning of the sentence, that that doesn't actually cover everybody on this call. 
that there, I, I will bet that there are people on this call who believe that capitalism itself structurally sucks things dry and is not reformable. Um, I, I'm not sure I fall in that camp. I mean, the, we can probably still repair capitalism, but it is not a long shot to think that capitalism as the primary structure for distributing goods and being efficient and motivating people, um, like the motivating people part, I'm like, mm, not so sure. Uh, there's a whole bunch of issues that, that um, unpack right there as Doug kind of said, like th this might actually sort of split, up, split open. But I think that if we can approach these questions in a really generative way and in a, in a sort of uh, collaborative way, I think we can come into what to do that would work for all of us in, in those ways. Do you want to go ahead, Klaus? Yeah, then I think we need to put a time frame also into the equation here because what can we do now short term really effective because we're in an amazing mess uh, which we have to dig out of and where do we want to go to? Yeah, and, and I'm not sure it's a time frame as much as separating the philosophical conversation from the let's go do let's go quest this thing out and let's go do something productive thing so that we don't get bogged down in the philosophical conversation. Right. Um, and the, the philosophical conversation, by the way, has been going on for a couple hundred years and will probably continue for a while. Um, so I think the interesting thing here is to make it more visible, more manifest in ways that are useful to other people who are having the same conversation. Uh, because I, I don't know that we're going to conclude it. I don't know that we're going we're gonna to finish it, but we could help people see it differently, see it better. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, let's go back to Scott George Ingrid. Hey everybody, um, Matt, Kalamazoo is just a couple hours from me and it actually was the first interview that I had uh, where I was interested in design thinking. That was the first time I'd ever heard of it and so there I have a wonderful link to that and that whole southwestern Michigan area is just dynamite right now. Um, second thing, <clears throat> I woke up this morning and in that delicious state of <clears throat> not quite awake yet, but still conscious, I was able to completely rebuild my thinking skills program in my head. It has over a hundred elements and I was able to structurally hit every single one of them, which tells me that the structure leads to the pieces and that they all integrate and actually make sense because to have a hundred distinct bits all actually like reconstructable in my head was was my my test that this actually is is legit so I'm super excited about that um, and the last thing is this is something that I was thinking about in the middle of the week um, it's about the the bubbles that we live in and the thought is, because our feed is long, scroll, 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 but we can get to the end at the point where you see, okay, no new posts. We can forget how little we're actually seeing. Because <laughs> the feed is super long and we think, wow, there's so much, but we get to the end, the end, and then we think, Okay, well, I've I've covered my bases. I've seen I've seen what's out there, and we forget that. No, you're still only seeing just a little a little slice. So it's just something I was thinking about. So, thank you. You just made me think that there's no such thing as inbox zero with Twitter. <clears throat> <laughs> well, the best you can do is be caught up at the moment, and you're never really caught up because you clearly haven't read everybody's tweet or all the all the tweets you think you saw or anything like that which requires a Zen mindset of kind of letting go of the need to have covered it all, right? And I, I think of Twitter as this sort of river that I dip the ladle into. And I'm just like, sip, okay, what's going on right now? And then the, the river rushes on because it, it's truly a rushing torrent. Um, thank you. Let's go George and Grid Julian. Curious to know um, how many of you are um, sort of not extremely actively, but at least uh, participating in Twitter. So about half of you, okay, interesting. <clears throat> so I, I uh, 
a very productive morning that might um, ref reflect on all of this. Uh, I decided last night that I needed a slogan or a catchphrase or a um, one creativity exercise I use is paradoxical book title. Something that that sums up my mind skills system uh, so that I could ex not only explain it, but um, <clears throat> motivate people to be curious, curious about it. So I went through my usual creativity ritual, which is to dump a bunch of stuff on into Rome um, and then take a shower. So it was a very productive shower. <laughs> um, that's my secret weapon that I see a lot of other people have found. Um, if my skin could take it, I'd probably take six out, six showers a day and be more productive than Da Vinci, but be that as it may. Um, what I came up with in the shower was um, mind skills, power tools. Power tools being things that let a little tiny weak person cut down a gigantic tree or build a gigantic house or whatever. whatever. Um, so there are ways of not just leveraging, leveraging seems too, way too small. Um, you know, you can use a lever, but why use a lever when you can use a power tool? And it also takes it away from preaching at people, um, takes it away from telling people how to think to <clears throat> coming from their standpoint, enabling them to do bigger things. So um, I think the, the, the thing that OGM needs is not just a quest, which I loved, by the way, um, and I love the little check, the, the quest checklist you rattled off so quickly. It was very profound. Um, I think it needs to be, I would say, I would sum it up in two words, build something. Mm -hmm. Find something to build that will integrate <clears throat> All the knowledge it will force everything together it forces the philosophy to be concretized it forces people to think about what the concrete pieces mean it pulls everything together so i've always always found throughout my life that building something is the is the key not just productivity but building something mm -hmm. getting something made i agree thank you george uh, Scott? Uh, for what it's worth, George and I have still not connected yet, and that's my fault. We are, we're working in parallel paths. Um, and, and just as a reiteration, my program is three large buckets, systems thinking, design thinking, and narrative thinking. And the design thinking is all about making. Mm -hmm. That's, it's, it's the, it's the practical portion of it. So I'm, I'm, you and I are in sync in separate paths here. <laughs> what, do you think about the, what do you think about the power tools idea? I like it. It makes sense. I have my own and I'm not going to share it at the moment because I don't want to affect your thinking. And I've, I've not been sharing some of mine. So Judith wisely counseled me to maintain my integrity and originality by being, by, or, or help me understand that by doing this, I can, I need to do it myself and not be too yeah, yeah, I understand. You know, I, and, and I think I don't want to tell you what I'm doing because I don't want to influence what you're doing because we're on we're in such parallel paths here. So once we get to the point where it's it's catalyzed a bit, then I think absolutely. Definitely. And and George, I put in the chat a link into my brain to power tools. And I have power tools for mavens, power tools for connectors, powerful tools for decision making, for critical thinking. For wow. refugees, for scholarly uh, scholarly writing, 
for nonprofits, for uh, like politics, I have a whole bunch of power tools because I think that the power tools analogy is lovely. It's a little bit of a male uh, uh, analogy, unfortunately. Um, but, but I think everybody pretty much can understand it. So um, let's go to Ingrid, Julian, and Lauren. So guys, I'm going to skip my turn tonight. I've had a day and don't have much to say, so I want to just absorb what's happening. Thank you, though. Sounds great. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, Julian. So I'm making slow progress with this task of importing the SIGGRAPH digital library into Neo4j. Uh, I won't say steady progress, but it's just slow is a better description. Recently, we've had to deal with the fact that the organization took a devastating hit from 2020. I mean, major loss of revenue. So the planning committee um, has had lots of discussions about how to handle that and try and increase the relevance of a professional organization in the state of the world today. Um, and then I was gonna mention a research project I found quite interesting at the University of Washington, which was to be do better chroma key switching in Zoom sessions. So for example, you can see that I appear balder on the screen than I actually am, <laughs> thankfully. And they have, are working on an algorithm to do better detection of this. And they said they'll create a filter to eventually get you <clears> to show up better on your Zoom session. That sounds um, great. When we get to uh, the part about creating uh, this manifesto or handbook that you were talking about, then I'm looking forward to that because I have some ideas. Cool. Thanks, Julian. Uh, Lauren, Pete, Doug. Do you mind if I go last? Not at all. Okay. Pete, Doug. Uh, Eric. Thank you. Good morning, all. I'm going to go really fast with a bunch of stuff. Um, uh, this week or so has been uh, lots of interesting OGM stuff for me, kind of OGM um, infrastructure. Uh, we had a great steering call on Tuesday. Um, and along with a lot of cool content talking about stuff, then we ended up having also a steering meeting about you know, what OGM is working on, what it could be working on, how to how to project manage that a little bit better. Um, and so one of the things I'll be doing is is kind of morphing an Airtable that I had into a dashboard of, you know, what OGM is doing. Um, there's a lot of connectivity from the dashboard to the uh, directory stuff that Vincent and I and, and uh, Jerry are working on. So lots of, lots of Airtable stuff going on. Uh, one of the epiphanies I had, or one of the observations I had, I had this, I have this thing, this personal thing where I'm a, a wiki brained person. Um, if I'm doing a task, I'm a lot more happy if we're all doing it together. Um, that doesn't work uh, in a lot of situations. Um, it works better almost all the time, which makes me super sad, but it makes it works better almost all the time. If one person works on a document and other people look at it and make little comments and stuff like that. So I'm thinking the the dash, the, the earlier, um, the earlier revision of this idea was something where I was thinking everybody would just be using it and everybody would be happy. Now it's like, um, it's going to be a dashboard that I maintain. Maybe some other people will help me maintain it, um, but mostly it's going to be my view of, of OGM, which will mean that it'll be better maintained, um, at least for a while. Um, uh, I had a really cool call yesterday with Tr Tony Marcotis, um, who uh, was energized to help OGM kind of diagram itself um, or get, get, get some diagrams. He's a, a diagrammer. Um, uh, activity diagrams and entity diagrams and stuff like that. So um, he and I had a great call where I was telling him, you know, everything that uh, OGM does. I'm going to show you notes that I took. They're going to look like a mess, but there's a reason for it. Um, when when I was doing this, I got on Zoom for the very first time, and so it looks like a mess because. Just a tip to everybody to switch to speaker view if you're in gallery view and you'll be able to see what it's showing. Bigger. Yeah, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, you can't see anything anyway. Uh, there's. <laughs> it looks like a codex Thanks. from ancient, Thanks, ancient papyrus. Uh, if go. I turn off uh, most of the layers, you can see what's going on You know, on, on one of those. So all Great. the pages are smushed together. Um, this was just my way of like drawing and talking and explaining something. And I thought it worked really well with Tony. So I was super happy to, um, super happy to find out that I could use this on Zoom really well. Um, and I'm going to kind of uh, 
try to improve that. Um, I'll ask Tony. So my notes are really just me nattering away at Tony while he was taking his notes that he's going to turn into nice flow diagrams. Um, I'm going to ask Tony if it's okay if I share like a, a recording, a short recording of, you know, just all the like things going up and, and you can kind of get a very, very, you know, you can kind of see two hours and 30 minutes, 30 seconds or whatever. So um, uh, anyway, more on that as, as we continue kind of. Uh, one of the really interesting things, uh, I, and I was saying this, um, it was fun talking to somebody. It was super, super illuminating for me talking to somebody uh, um, who didn't know a lot about OGM, but was interested in hearing about it um, and explaining what we do, how we do it and things like that. And one of the things I drew was this pie chart. Um, you see the big thing there is being in community. And then another thing is sense making and another thing is meta. So what I was saying, this is not a literal pie chart of necessarily the proportions, but if you can kind of think about that, one of the things that OGM does most right now is just this, this call being in community. So we had a whole talk about, so what do you mean being in community? Does that mean like, you know, talking about the projects you're all working on and what's going on? And I was, I, I compared it to, it's kind of like a church actually. Um, and he said, oh, I get it. It's not the, the church where there's a big preachy guy up at the top, you know, in the front and blah, blah, blah. It's one of those things where everybody's singing and happy and talking and stuff like that. Was, that's it. So, um, so just talking through that for five minutes with, with somebody who hadn't, like the Quakers, exactly. Um, and Jerry can tell you more why the, why the Quakers. Um, so being excited about that with, uh, with Tony um, was super cool. And also then going, okay, so we only have 100%. How do we get, you know, I think where we ended up at the end of the call was, I think OGM wants to change the world. And I think it wants to do that with a modicum of sense making and then taking action. I think that's what OGM is about. Um, but to get there, we have to trade off this being in community. And this is like for I, I was telling him for some people, this is, you know, the entirety of what OGM means to them. It's like, this is so generative and so wonderful. We come along every week and I get my my 90 <clears throat> minutes fix of like calm and serenity and people being wonderful and generative and thoughtful and things like that. And that's all they need for OGM, you know, but to get that the little bit of sense making and lots of action, we're, we're going to have to balance off action and being in community. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, let's see, I've also got uh, in the Free Jerry's Brain thing, um, we've got a lot going on. Um, we're, we're finally getting to the point where we think we can start going a little bit public with some of the work that we've been doing uh, mm -hmm. with Jerry's Brain uh, information and the graph database. Another thing that was amazing talking Tony through, you know, it's like, I, I got a deep dive on telling somebody else what Jerry does with the brain. It's like, imagine Ooh, cool. having um, 400,000 things that you've written down over the course of 22 years and being able to sense make, you know, across different topics. You know, we started off just randomly. I started off with, um, uh, I forget some kind of some subset of racism and we you know we walked from racism up to pop music and you know all kinds of places and i'm like so i i can't really do this very well because i'm not a power user jerry's got a power tool called the brain um and you know kind of like both of us we're having flash bulbs you know that means jerry's like super intelligent and he can put together stuff that you know um uh, and, and not you know super intelligent in a way that probably literally no, nobody else can be, right? You can connect, uh, Jerry can connect, you know, a bunch of different things. And every time he makes a jump, when he makes 10 jumps, he's looking at dozen, a dozen or two dozen things at a time. So I can make, you know, uh, I can make a research project that says, here's how, uh, you know, the insurrection of, of this month was, is, you know, kind of historically related to something that happened in the 16th centers. I could actually do that research in half an hour on the web and write a decent report. Jerry could do that in a few minutes and every step of the way that he's making those relationships, he's lighting up, you know, literally 20 or 30 things every, every single step. And, you know, if he wanted to, he could go down any of those paths very quickly, very easily. So, um, uh, let's see, there's, 
one more. So, so I got myself distracted with the Friedrich's brain. Friedrich's brain is doing some cool stuff. We're going to be releasing things in the next se several weeks. Mark Trexler and I are working on the same Friedrich's brain technology, um, uh, making ex exports extracts of um, of his climate web brain, which is a, a huge, massive database. Uh, also, um, awesome. Uh, he's, we started off making what we, what we called microsites, you know, here, here are, you know, like 10 different topics or 10 different thoughts from his climate, climate web. And then he's like, okay, well, if I have one microsite, then I could have pretty soon he has 10 or 20. And then pretty soon he's got this idea that those things are these fairly massive, but well-constructed, well set up, um, views of, you know, like like a like a, a small textbook of chapters about certain things and so he's working on kind of a business version of that and a more um, um, a more academic version of that uh, I we're, we're kind of talking through how you can make a website and also a ebook or a PDF from the same the same set of documents um, so I, I I think I know how to do the ebook and the PDF now, which is really cool. So this would be something where instead of just like 10, 10 thoughts in a micro microsite, you'd have 10 or 20 chapters, each with 10 or you know 20 thoughts. Um, very exciting. I'm, su I'm super excited about it. Last but not least, um, I'll send an email to the list. There's a cool thing going on tomorrow, I think, uh, in the afternoon. Uh, Pacific afternoon, so it's going to be clumsy for uh, European people, unfortunately. Uh, it's called, I think, One World Birthday. It's uh, Wikipedia is having having their 20th <coughs> birthday, I think. Um, and there's a bit of a celebration, a bit of a talk. So there's a, a, a really cool Zoom webinar thing that you can join and learn more about Wikipedia. And then after that, they're going to have a uh, an interactive session uh, actually doing Wikipedia edits. One of the cool things uh, about it would, to me was just the format of it. Um, uh, Pete Forsyth uh, and, uh, and uh, Ward Cunningham came up with this idea that they called the park bench um, format. Uh, so they could have, if, if they were recapping you know, 20, years, 20, 20 years of Wikipedia, they could have a, a panel and kind of go talking head style one by one. Uh, what they came up with instead is the park bench. Uh, two people are sitting on the park bench. Uh, one person is in interviewing another. So Ward will interview somebody, somebody will interview Ward, and they'll, they'll go on like that kind of serially down the line. And so it's, uh, it's a, a little podcast conversation more than you know just this big panel thing. Um, and that leads into, they've been using that format in something they call WikiDojo, where you have a pilot and a co-pilot um, editing a wiki page. So the formats kind of blend together nicely. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, uh, it's kind of geeky, uh, but many OGMers are, are probably into it. So I'll send out a, 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 I'll send a link to announcements and stuff like that to the list. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Matt, you've been really patient. Yeah, I just want to real quick, Pete, um, um, and I actually I need to come back to it because I need a password, but we've been working in this program for uh, building a program for one of our clients in, the, in a software package um, known as RISE. And RISE is a way of, I don't know if you guys have heard of this at all, but um, it is, um, it's a way of building learning modules that you can organize in any way you want and then move around and stuff. But so what I did is I basically built every learning module as a sort of standalone knowledge objects that have a path that you go through them, which have labs and lectures and all that kind of stuff. But, but when I talk to them, I can go and grab anything and then run a mini assignment. So I can, um, which is a little bit different than just having the knowledge available. It's packaged in a way. And you know, this is one of those areas I just have to pull up the, um, I just have to pull up my new password for it. Um, but I, I wanna show you guys it in just a second. Cool, thank you. Uh, Mike, do you wanna jump in in the meantime? Yeah, just uh, first an apology. I, I really wish I could be on these calls every week, but every other week I've got 
three things scheduled at this time. <laughs> but uh, lots of exciting stuff going on at the Carnegie Endowment and a couple of personal things as well. Uh, the things that I'd love to share with this group and get some input are first off, my junior fellow is working on a project on trusted data and machine learning. Uh, every think tank in the planet seems to be worried about ethical AI and trying to tell Google and Amazon how to build their tools. Uh, the real problem is getting the users of artificial intelligence to be smart about what they're buying and to use it in a responsible way. I think ethical is such a vague term, but responsible and accountable, that, 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 that actually has action or uh, that can, can drive action. So our idea is to look at uh, building a framework of, of pretty high level questions that people in different disciplines could use when thinking about what they need to do a particular task. And we're focusing on military applications, weapon systems. We're looking at uh, the workforce, development of the workforce, both training opportunities and, and hiring decisions. And then we're looking at, at uh, epidemiology and how do we use the big data that comes from <laughs> everywhere to see where there might be drug interaction problems or new viruses. But in each case, we wanna develop a sense of, okay, how do you get the right data? How do you store the data the right way? How do you, how do you be responsible in this new world? So that's, that's one thing we're working on. Um, the other thing that Carnegie as a whole is working on is how to be open to new voices. Um, the international relations think tank world is very white, very male, very old, um, and I'm 61 and white and male. Um, but the problem is how do you avoid tokenism <clears throat> and how do you really get the best voices that you know, are the next generation in some cases, are working in places where we don't usually look like the NGOs. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a challenge that uh, we just, we had a long call just now on this problem. And then um, on, the, on the personal front, I'm um, dealing with two parents and one future mother-in-law who are both, or all three of them are, are trying to deal with this new world of COVID at a time when they're going into dementia and losing their long-term, losing their short-term memory. And I, I, I'm beside myself because we have these great technologies that I could use to talk to them face-to-face. -face, but whereas two years ago, we could do a Skype call, they can't. And I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm a technological optimist who's very frustrated right now. And we're, we're, we're probably gonna have to move them from one part of their retirement community into a memory care unit. And it's, it's just, it's a problem. Sorry, On the sorry. positive side, I'm planning a Zoom wedding for myself and Kathleen. <laughs> we have a week, month and a half to do that. So Yay. if anybody offline wants to tell me a great experience they've had, we're working with a company called Wedley, which will do everything from the uh, ceremony itself to the dance party afterwards. That sounds wonderful, yeah. Awesome. I remember, so, I, so my mom lived to use Lyft because we don't really like Uber, but I, I taught her to use Lyft for six months or eight months or something like that. She used it a couple of times to get back and forth and it would give her a little, a little bit of independence. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was before she went into assisted living. And then there was the day when the app was too confusing for her. Mm -hmm. and, and she just couldn't make her way through and she didn't know what she was doing. And I was like, oh damn, we've lost that. And, and I would have given a lot for a simpler app. I didn't think about being her pilot from afar and basically booking it for her and just telling her to, you know, talking her through the, the, the travel. I could have done that, but I didn't do that. But there's, there's huge opportunities to simplify a lot of these things for elders who are beginning to lose words and lose logic. Um, and we're not doing it. Everything is still just a little bit, and, and even just, you know, an iPad, because the moment you've touched the screen and gone somewhere else and lost the app, you're screwed. So how about freezing the screen so that, so that in the app, if you touch the screen, nothing happens, right? And just making it so that little, little tiny touchable areas do something, that would be a great boon because half of elders are losing what they're, what, this cool thing they're looking at because 
they touched accidentally and they don't know how to get back to the thing that was that was just there, for example. I think there's a, there's a huge number of things we could do to simplify tech uh, for elders. And Just to add one more piece to that, um, another challenge I'm facing is my father, who's always been very politically engaged and watching way too much Fox News. And, and he's completely discombobulated now. I mean, oh, wow. Talk to him and he's, he's like, I just don't have an opinion. It's all very confusing. And, and the current events might be the equivalent. Maybe there's the one page that every 85 year old could read to provide some structure to their day. And it, it'd have to yeah. be very carefully written so it would be above reproach and not bias. But he just is hearing so many different, he's, he's, not, he's not schizophrenic, but he's hearing so many voices, yeah. so, including his own kids. <laughs> Uh, exactly. So it, it, so it's a, it's a challenge there. L the other last thing to add is that I'm working on a project on uh, digital uh, sovereignty. So mm. I'm trying to explain how countries around the world perceive this idea of control of their part of cyberspace, mm -hmm. whatever that means. Um, Julian Scott and Judy with short comments on this. I'm sorry. So uh, yeah, two short comments. One is what you bring up is why not have the screen not lock, have the screen locked so it doesn't move. This is actually a fairly old thing because most flying now is done with iPads mm -hmm. and you cannot have a pilot who's you know just a few hundred feet above landing have to fiddle with an iPad to wake it up and get the thumb in the right place. All right, so this is actually a fairly established technology What it takes somebody crossing from one discipline over to the other. Yeah. And then the other point was that a lot of, this is a something that I've been constantly ranting about, which is that most design is done from a viewpoint of, I've created a technology and you must adapt your life so that my technology can do something for you. And it's really got to be the other way around. So. Agreed. Um, Scott and Judy. Very quick observation about what Mike was saying and then about <clears throat> Jerry saying simplifying things. I realized when I was trying to teach my mom computers that she grew up in a world where a knob did one thing, a switch did one thing, a screen did one thing. It was always static. And I saw it first when keyboards, electronic keyboards went from a million knobs to one little interface and a, and a button that went up and down. And all of a sudden this one little window, you had to know where you are and you had to keep track of that. And that's where I think it jumped. And so when you look at every screen that we have now, the buttons depend on, you know, what screen you're on and it, it, they can move around and the, the interaction parts of it are not set. And I think that to me was the big moment and how, Jerry, to your point, how do you get back to a setting where things are just locked in? How do you make static uh, interface in a mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Judy. And then Judy, if you wanna go ahead and check in. <laughs> okay. Uh my comment was more of a question and might be overly naive, but one of the dimensions of the multitude of information and discernment process is just the bulk of it. And I'm wondering if there's some way that as we develop our materials and reach out, if we could sort of give a pro con neutral view, view of things or left, right, center, or whatever you'd want to call it, but just extract and consolidate to simpler messages the core of three different perspectives and then open the opportunity for a person to explore that more deeply in ways that would engage their thinking capacity or discernment at whatever level they're able. But at least it would be, I think it'd be true to our goal to be balanced. Um, and we can, if we want, we could symbolize with a, a star or something, our preferred consensus, but that's, that's not taking away from giving the, the full spectrum of, of view. Um, in terms of check-in, I'm really focusing right now on the educational process and reaching out to various agencies that deal with the educational process on how to teach critical thinking at an earlier stage um, and using different models for trying to do that. So I'll, I'll keep you posted as things move on. Thank you, Judy. Um, Doug, Eric, Ken. Okay, um, I'm going to say a little bit more than I usually do about what I'm working on. Uh, as some of you know, I'm working with a group of economists on trying to do new economic thinking. And it's very hard because economics has defined itself as a closed system that pushes social concerns, anthropology, sociology, outside the boundaries. 
So normally when you think of trying to change something, you look for leverage points within the field that you're in. But if the leverage points have been pushed outside, you're in trouble in trying to change things. Uh, as we grapple with this, we're coming up against the issue of, of power and the relation of power to politics. Uh, and that's something, it's amazing. We do not read political theory very much. It's very hard to find somebody uh, who reads the political theories. Um, let's see, I'll give an example of how economics has pushed things out. Now you're all familiar with the idea of macro and microeconomics. It was done explicitly to avoid issues of social class because if you look at the micro, it's just people. There's no social class there. So let's look at the macro. Gee, it's the whole thing. Uh, there's no room for social class there. So it must not be important. Uh, that kind of thinking is <laughs> pretty frustrating, but very powerful. Um, another angle that we've been working on is the implications of quantum mechanics, of all things, for the way to think about the humanities and the social sciences. And basically dealing with the issues of moving from a Newtonian to a probabilistic world and the world where the observer is part of the phenomena that's being observed. So that you can't write an economics paper without raising the question of why is that what you think? Uh, what do you try and write about that? So that we understand who the writer is and what they're doing. Now to get to the issue of capital, uh, which is central to this. Economics is set up to limit the social discourse so that capital is safe. And basically capital is that some part of society owns the assets of society and the others don't. Uh, and it's very hard to think of changing things when capital wants to defend the current asset model, uh, which means that things can't change. So dealing with capital uh, becomes critical to uh, re uh, thinking through how society can respond to climate change. So I realize. You just accidentally turned off your video, I think. Uh, I realize that, uh, you know, that's a, a mouthful, but that's what we're coping with. I'm super happy you're opening those conversations because uh, econ is such an insular trade um, that it scares me that we put so much reliance on it because we've there's, a, there's narratives that run our society and econ is a really important uh, foundational piece of the narratives that are busy screwing up a lot of things. And so, so broadening that discourse is super, super important. That's great. Um, let's go to Eric Ken Stacy. Okay. Um, this weekend I finished this call uh, uh, for together first. Uh, Maybe I can just, uh, I wanted to share one thing with it in the screen. I think it's useful to show. Um, just a moment. So there's, uh, together first is like building on what the Global Challenges Foundation put out. And they, um, it was, it's about creating an alternative governance system or complementary to the UN. And here's like these two lists, the online <laughs> reference list and the new shape library. That's two kind of lists of possible uh, UN reforms. And basically in this call, they asked for, uh, yeah, can you build on an existing proposal? And I think any of the systems that, that OGM is working on and, um, and some other, wait, I'm going back to the screen. So it's a, it's a huge list of proposals um, with a lot of different ways of solving the issues of governance within the, our global system of, of governance. Um, and for, it, it breaks my mind to try to articulate, articulate what I want to do. And then yesterday I had a talk with Vincent Arena and I saw what he created and it was already incredible like 
how like-minded we th thought once we were talking the first time and I, I was just explaining what I wanted to do. And then he showed me his system and I'm like, so like wow, it's so similar, but he actually created a, a prototype. And I, and, and I showed you these two lists, like any of these two lists could be developed, any of these issues, it could be like prior, easily prioritized like what kind of reform of the global governance system would work best? Which organizations could work together to do to make this happen? Uh, all this makes so much more sense if you've got a system like maybe Over Global Mind or what Vincent is creating. And for me, it's been uh, really nice to find out about this group and the people that are part of it. And um, it's like, <laughs> it's a, it's a mixture of many things because it's also a very long emotional ride for me where I was very, very lonely, just really alone. And when I was like in, in the Impact Hub, which is this social innovation community would say, yeah, they work on similar things, but then almost nobody really got what I was talking about. And now I find it similar people. And I think it gives me a sense like, oh, wow, I'm not alone. I can work on this together. I can all the balancing that happens in my mind alone can happen with others. And uh, I think one of the main questions that I want to answer is how to not get so overwhelmed so often, because uh, that's like my biggest, I, I want to have a really, I want to have a fulfilling life while I do this. And that has been a challenge because it's so complex. Uh, but I'm hopeful now again, that this is possible. Yeah. Um. I, Thank you so much, Eric. That's uh, that's like fabulous. Um, mm. I'm really I'm I'm just happy that that you know we found you and and uh, you found us and and that this feels right. And what you're talking about points to lots of really interesting things. One of which comes up to me a lot is there's this very tricky thing about how do we improve the state of the art of, for humans without reduplicating and reinventing and going in too many different directions and each of us having 12 initiatives. And so how do we, how do we find neighboring initiatives and figure out whether we can blend and amplify and fix or whether, nope, we're just sort of different and we're just gonna have to, to figure out you know, different paths to the sea somehow. But, the, but that, that notion of joining other people's initiatives and amplifying them somehow is, is critical here. Otherwise, we're just all going to dissipate. With all these great ideas, we're just gonna go into the ether in lots of different directions and not get much of anything done. Um, so uh, the, a piece of the trickiness is even just sort of discovery and overlay or comparison or matching up of, of idea frameworks and idea schemes. And sometimes the ideas are named very differently and they look really different. And sometimes the same idea is manifest in two different ways and one of them catches on because it was designed better or whatever. Like there's all sorts of things that happen here. Um, for simpler examples, look back on instant messaging and how the different offerings you know, came into the world and which ones won in the end. And there's all these different elements that, that go there. But I love that. I love the, the generativity of the conversation. Thank you. Um, and I had, I have to scroll back up, Ken Stacy Klaus. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, you're all interested in doing such interesting things, and I've basically just been glued to the media for the last week. Um, it's been horrifying uh, and enlightening, and just like, holy shit, you know, um, what the hell is going on here? Uh, we came within inches of, of having a full on coup. Uh, I mean, if if the Capitol Police had been overwhelmed just a little bit more, it's very possible we'd have a bunch of dead senators and congressmen laying around the Capitol, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and and watching the reactions on both sides has been astonishing to me. Um, so I, I don't usually spend a lot of time immersed in media. I, I make an effort to, to not go there because I know it, it has a specific effect on my mood um, of feeling powerless and outraged and, um, I don't feel, I feel pretty outraged. I don't know that I feel powerless about this, but, um, you know, cause I am seeing things coming along where uh, they're now doing a lot of investigation. You know, for one thing, the, the, the organizers seem to be pretty smart, but the participants didn't, you know, all these people who are like, you know, make sure you get my face on camera. I want you to know that I'm here, right? Okay, great. FBI's got that. And 
you know, hey, let's steal an iPad from from a senator's office and go home and turn it on and have the FBI bust down our door because there's no way they're tracking that shit, right? Um, but the deeper implications of, you know, who's funding this and who's organizing this and where it's coming from. Uh, a friend of mine happened to be, uh, he, he's not a right winger, he's but he's not, not a right winger, a parlor account. And he found a three minute video that was put up literally moments before uh, parlor was taken down. And it's a QAnon video, and it is chilling to watch. It's basically all this footage of Trump over the years of his uh, of his big rallies, and um, I, I can. It's three minutes. I can share my screen if you want to see it, but it's disturbing to watch. So I don't know if you want, people want to see it or not. So, um, is it posted online anyplace? Uh, it was taken down from Power. I don't know that it's online anywhere. So I, I happen to have it. He sent it to me by by messenger. And can you? I don't want. Can you put it in, my, in a Google Drive or something like that and share it on the? Yeah, uh, I can do that. I'll, I'll put it up on the forum actually. Somewhere, yeah, in the forum yeah. would be great because right now I think it's probably. Uh, yeah, I don't want to bum people out. Yeah, but, trigger warning so, for everybody. Yeah, exactly. right. Trigger, big trigger warning. It's really chilling. Although there's a very interesting thing at the end where it shows the uh, 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 the globe, you know, rotating from right to left, but darkness falls on California and spreads across to the east, which <laughs> kind but of blew my Ken, mind. Are you? Are you putting this on a par with films of the Nuremberg rallies? Uh, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think that it's the same kind of thing. You know, um, there's just this very, it's a very chilling thing to watch um, because it's, it's the radicalization, radicalization of many millions of people in this country. Um, what really has me stirred up and concerned right now is how many people truly believe that the election was stolen. Um, you know, they've been lied to over and over and they refuse to believe evidence. They refuse to accept that, you know, um, the, the courts, which are evidence-based, say there's no evidence for the fraud. We're throwing this case out and they turn around and say, this is, this is stealing the election. So I don't know what it is they want to take back because the country was founded on a court system that, that is based on evidence. So I don't know where they want to go with taking things back. And um, this is an enormous concern for me because uh, you know, I live in a pretty liberal place, Marin County, but um, I have friends all over the country and, and you know, there's places and I don't have to go very far. I can drive an hour and be in deep red territory in California. Um, and we have to uh, we have to live with this. We have to find a way to de-radicalize and begin conversations that are going to let people come together to lower the temperature, you know, um, to really inquire, well, you know, what is it that you, that you would consider to be evidence that you've been lied to, for example. Um, so structuring those kinds of conversations is really uh, a, an enormously important thing. And I don't know that the next administration has that on their minds. I think they're just going to like, you know, we're putting our program in place and that pendulum swing thing isn't going to work. So I'm really concerned about how can we begin to, you know, think together into, all right, what would be a, a, a way to do this? And I know the, the, there's an organization called Braver Angels, which if you haven't seen, does some really interesting work. Um, so I think we need a, a lot more uh, weight behind organizations like that. So that's my somewhat disturbed check-in. Thanks, Ken. And I, I, I totally empathize with you being like sucked into the vortex of news and what's happening. Um, I, I, I went into the same place in the last week through the events of the coup and everything after. And I, I I tuned in and happened to watch Trump sort of in his incitement moments. I watched that live. And then I watched as people started going up the Capitol steps and I tuned into two different shots uh, and, then, and then all hell broke loose. And uh, it was really interesting. Uh, and I will remind us that what you just described, Ken, is really OGME territory. This is, this is like meat and potatoes for the non-vegetarian What's the what's the vegetarian metaphor for meat and potatoes? Is it like uh, okra? Satan, <laughs> Satan and okra. You know, Satan sounds too much like Satan, so I'm not sure Satan should be on the meat and potatoes menu here. But anyway, the textured you know, vegetable protein. The textured oh, that sounds so good. Part of the problem with vegetarianism is textable te textured protein. <laughs> tofu and tofu and kale, meat and potatoes. There we go. Um, Stacy, Klaus, and John. So I'm right where Ken is. 
except in the past 24 hours, I'm kind of focused on what I see as a bright pocket. Um, I'm starting to see more stories of people who have been radicalized that are now talking about what happened to them. And I've been trying to magnify those conversations wherever I can and to get just average people on Facebook that usually don't talk to each other or usually fight with each other to really hear that because there's something from for each end, you know, whether you're um, whatever side you are, there's something to sympathize with in the stories. And I remember, you know, years ago we used to listen to, or I remember at least being in school and learning about, you know, how people are brought into street gangs and radicalized that way. And it's that commonality that I hope, I hope with more of these stories, we can get somewhere. And I just on a personal note, I was floored yesterday to find out that somebody very close to me who I thought was lost for good to Trump has now totally changed her mind and is an independent. So if that can Ooh. happen, anything can happen. Yeah. So that's <laughs> um, thank you, Stacy. There's a, a woman who's on Twitter and an author and a bunch of other things. Her name is uh, Chrissy Stroop, um, and she's fabulous. She's uh, an evangelical, and she she wrote the book Emptying the Pews. And following her is super super interesting because there's a huge religious angle to what's happened here as well. And uh, you know, whoever is retweeting her and all that, there's a whole ecosystem around exploring what is the evangelical side of this uh, phenomenon that, that that's happening as well. But but listening to the testimonies of ex-evangelicals and ex-Mormons and, and so on and so forth is super fascinating. I, I just want to add though, what's really important is finding that middle ground because yeah. people are just so extreme in their opinions. Agreed. So I put the list of, of people we need. We have 20 minutes left in our call. We have Klaus, John, Mike, Vincent, Yuri, and Lauren. Klaus, will you take us away? Yeah, I actually had, had a pretty good week. Um, I'm in a discussion group with, with a uh, list of NGOs, uh, Rural Coalition, Sunrise Movement. It's hosted by the Sierra Club. Um, and we are having really uh, good conversations. I mean, the conversations are advancing. And where we are is that we are merging with the Climate 21 project, and I put, it, put the link out there, which is a document that the incoming administration is pulling together to have a running start the moment they hit the ground. What you can see on, on this document is the amount of damage that the Trump administration has done uh, uh, in, in the agricultural sector. And I'm pretty sure you can go to any other sector, it will be the same. So this is uh, sort of a unique scenario where they have taken apart the science capacity of the USDA uh, to really respond uh, uh, in a in a you know, uh, uh, strong strong way, so what the rural coalition is now doing is to develop um, uh, statements that uh, bring in the concerns of uh, small farmers, community level food systems, social systems. So because every bill that is out there, like the Corn and Climate Solutions Act, for example, ignores the social design necessary uh, uh, that has to be part of, of, uh, of, of a bill coming forth now. Um, so we get first of all into systems thinking because we have like the, uh, the water watch and the animal rights. And so you have like, you know, 10 different uh, groups who are all fighting over parts of the elephant you know it's like walking around and everybody has a different part of the elephant but doesn't see the picture so we have we are now working on look we're going to have like one shot you know to really do one or two things that will make a big difference where are the leverage points you now and the leverage points clearly are in the meat market so they'd be working you now to crystallize the Prime Act, which decentralizes the meat market and delegates the authority over 
community level slaughterhouses to the states. You know, that, will, that will instantly free the markets and create competition between the states. Uh, and it will relieve you know, the pressure on CAFOs and the way that all is handled. And then the other thing is to open up SNAP so that SNAP money can be accepted widely within the catering community where you have you know, so millions of people unemployed. Uh, what's that, what's that? Uh, Sorry. And, and then on the other hand, you have people lining up on food banks, uh, getting pieces of food they don't know what to do with. So, so, so that's, that's right now this push-pull. SNAP um, is known as food stamps. Mm -hmm. Oh, SNAP, oh, I'm sorry, SNAP, yeah, this is food stamps. Um, and there are, there are programs around this. So, so we're narrowing down, prioritizing uh, the initiatives. We decided uh, to postpone the Kiss the Crown uh, webinar, which would be hosted by the president of the Sierra Club um, at, until the end of February, because right now there's just too much going on. There's too much noise in the media market. Um, and then, and then position that, you know, to create a foundation of here is uh, 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 agriculture. This is what it is. This is what it should not be. Here's where we can go forward with. So it has been has been a good week. That sounds great, Klaus. And I love um, learning some of the texture, some of the details about where the points of leverage are in the systems that you care about. So the the, the, the slaughterhouse point came up in omnivores dilemma in the chapter on polyface farms and the way they do farming, they have cattle, but they can't be as economically useful as they want to be because they're not allowed to slaughter the cattle and there's no slaughterhouse nearby. They have to go to one of the big industrial slaughterhouses and that changes the game. Uh, otherwise they're allowed to slaughter their chickens. They do, they sell them locally. So they're, there's like the chickens go from pecking on the cow poop to local, um, local diners, like, you know, boom, boom, boom. Same thing can happen to cattle. So I think, could, I think that's what you're talking about. You could have micro farmers uh, raise a couple hundred chicken and have a few pigs that they raise by feeding them all their waste products. Um, and the chicken are sort of still scratching their food together. Um, and, but then you need to be able to access the market uh, and get uh, and sell your product. You know? And that's where the hang up is because the... Uh, right now, the meat markets are USDA controlled and we are verified, and that system is just open. Yeah. Um, cool. Aren't you describing the way things used to be before food turned into a big commercial industry? Yeah, it's going back to the future, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's go, John. I've got the list here. John, Mike, Vincent, Jury, Lauren. Okay. Uh, well, several people on the call have made reference to parents, relatives, friends who are uh, coping with mental or physical decline. I've been working at that uh, full time for years, uh, trying to come up with ways to help people creatively resist their decline. And I also had a personal life in the sense of, you know, I would do that maybe 40 hours a week. And then I had the other part of my life. And what's happened recently indirectly as a result of COVID, more people who know me personally, not professionally, have run into this situation where their, their friends are declining and they want advice or help, or they changed, the insurance changed and the insurance company says, oh, you can go to this doctor, but they try to go to that doctor and the doctor says, no, no, we don't accept, uh, we're this physician group, we don't accept that anymore and we don't accept this again. So I've found that my my personal life has gotten squeezed and my writing has gotten squeezed because I'm, I'm trying to help people who, who know me and know that I can be an advocate. And uh, so I'm trying to get back into balance. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm closer to getting a few people who haven't been able to get uh, reassigned to a doctor, get them reassigned and come up with other kinds of things to help the people so I can get get back to writing and I'm hoping, and also even contacting people who are not declining, who I owe them calls and feedback and you know they've called me and messaged and, and I'm like, okay, I'll get back to you, but I've, I've got to deal with this kind of emergency situation. Um, I, I'm uh, a little conflicted about mentioning this, but I will say that I did write about this. I did write about 
creatively helping someone who's who's in mental decline and it's on my medium page if you want to search under my name john kelly is very common but if you put the middle initial n in uh, you can find a story called saving rubies which is about uh, a client i had who was very tough in resisting her own mental decline and and was was fascinating to work with as a result of that hope to have more news later yeah, thank you, John, so much. Okay. Um, Mike Vincent Yuri. Uh, I already checked in, I think. Oh, so. that's right. I think you're right. Sorry about that. Uh, Vincent Yuri, and then Lauren. Vincent, you're here. There you go. I'm meeting. Good. Yep. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah. Okay, I, I want to be very brief. I've missed the, missed the timing, but. Uh, I came because I, I, I remember the call before Christmas was so painful because it was quite clearly that what we need is what I've been designing for for these years. And uh, and really, the Jerry, when you say design from trust, okay, that was really the a good way of uh, of describing the architecture. And it's really designed for trust. And uh, I've just been uh, very successful with the fission integration. That really means that the, the design phase is really completed. So it's ready to, ready, the prototype's ready to be built and I'm looking for sponsors. So that's can, where I can am. You, can you describe Fission really briefly? Because I saw the tweet screen where is, you were fish, talking yeah. about this, but I don't really know much about Fission. Well, Fission is basically, yeah, it's the same thing that I, I described as Trail Hub. They really have this web native, vision of web native, which means what if the only thing you need is a browser? Think about it. No more servers, no backend development, cutting down the complexity of, of, of making some capability available is the one person, single creative can do it. You don't need design. It basically factors out the authentication, the storage, everything. And the whole thing is, is designed uh, sort of commons based peer production. That's the model. And the very data is common at the same time encrypted. So it, it's revolutionary. Really. Super interesting. It's Super a game interesting. changer and it fits in exactly with what I've been doing. So that's why I'm their number one cheerleader, because they basically they basically accelerated my work by at least six months because they already that's done that bit that I don't need. Right. To do. So that, that's all I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Vincent, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, yeah. And just real quick, I just wanted to mention I'm the type of person that if something's not on my calendar, <laughs> I'm not there. So Scott reminded me about this call. Thanks, Scott. And um, I was wondering if we have, or if not, I could volunteer to make a shared Google calendar, um, if that would be more helpful. Or I don't know why, but for some reason, I stopped getting the, the calendar invites. So um, Hank and I have gone back and forth. We had some screw ups with the calendar invites. And there was at one point there were duplicate entries and there was a whole bunch of stuff. And we've kind of screwed it up so thoroughly that I'm putting a, a, a reminder email on the, on the OGM mailing list just as a, as a hack. And I forgot to do it yesterday. So I did it this morning just before the call, which is done. So uh, I would love for a more expert person on calendars than I to uh, to solve this for us because I, I totally agree there should be a standing calendar for OGM <clears throat> and as we as we do more calls they should be on the same calendar so that people can know what's up this week what can I join I would I would love okay. that to happen I'm it turns out I am incapable of understanding the calendar dynamics myself can we can we think about this problem from the same level that we talked earlier which is how do we not create a piece of technology that other people have to adopt to but create something that allows it to adapt to the platforms and technologies that we, we currently use. And how do we create almost like interfaces between the various ways we track our time and something that is almost like a centralized API, you know, based exchange, right? Mm -hmm. I think what we're trying to do is just use the current calendaring infrastructure intelligently and I haven't been able to conquer that because clearly I, I end up with like duplicates and all that. So the idea is not to you know invent anything new, uh, but to just go back in and, and do it. Uh, Ken, I am totally out of date. I'm feeling very very antiquated. Um, yeah, I, when I when I get defeated by calendaring, it's when I when I'm like feeling my age, feeling my oats, whatever that comes from. Um, Lauren. Okay, I wanted to say. To you. Um, 
Remember Pete's announcement about the event tomorrow with the wiki, the wiki people. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna attend an event at eight thirty with Pete and Sherry, and then after that at nine thirty, um, I'll be co-presenting um, and for imagining Vicky, which is kind of like a, a visualization of data. So the advancement from. Uh, you know, like uh, what happened? What, what, what is it like when Jerry's brain is freed? What does that look like? And uh, Julian, it would be great to have you there. I, I don't know if you're going to be busy that time. I think 9.30 CET, which is 3.30 EST. Uh, can you send me a link? So. Yeah, yeah. I'll post it on the, uh, uh, Pete and I will post it together maybe. Cool, and, thank you. Uh, so on Monday, we, Conceptualize Ray Dalio has this uh, dock connector, Ray Dalio over at Bridgewater. And um, we were trying to conceptualize something that we think is better that can kind of capture uh, data about what's going on in meetings, but in a way that's maybe a little kinder than people don't feel like they're being judged. So we came up with our first uh, very simple tool and Pete helped me with this and um, Bentley, uh, Davis helped me with this. So I'm going to post it in the chat and I would love for you to participate. It's just a way of you just um, select your name and it's just a way to notice what's been happening on the call. If you have any appreciation you'd like to give to someone else. I'd love for you to follow the link, uh, try it out. It's just a, a test run um, and just to kind of give me feedback on it. Cool. Um, did I did we miss anybody who would like to check in? No, but could you just put the one world link at the bottom again so it's easy to find? That would be great. Jerry, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind if people are interested. Um, just quickly showing, quickly showing um, what this rise thing looks like. Please, that'd be great. You can you should okay. be able to screen share. And, and the, you know, the idea here, guys, is there may be systems that we use to um, build our knowledge, you know, the next version of the brain. I'm particularly um, excited about where Obsidian's going, um, just, just as an aside. But then um, this is Rise, and I can show you that basically I have this beginning section, and these are all the modules that I built into it, right? Um, and so you can, you can start and you, you, you've got your table of contents on the side, but you also have this thing. So put some objectives and then you, you start to click through it, right? I've introduced different labs. I've introduced things where you can put content that's explorable um, in a different way, right? Um, the, and, and so you can kind of see what are weak signals, um, what are different types of weak signals that you have. So I'm just kind of moving my knowledge. And so attributes of weak signals, how do you improve your detection? You know, so you can, you can, you can kind of structure the way that somebody goes through the process of discovery. And then the interesting thing is if you're having a conversation and I go, okay, there's a section on systems mapping, right? Which is, it, which is, um, thinking about systems thinking, there's a section on knowledge mapping, which is based on, you know, Jerry, Jerry's brain and what is knowledge mapping. This is kind of what I'm saying that knowledge mapping has these components, which are ultimately based off of um, Zettel casting, but then you can jump to, okay, in systems mapping, I want to get into feedback loops, or I want to get into stocks and flows, right? Or I want to talk about the six principles of persuasion and persuasion. So you can jump anywhere around and it seamlessly jumps from section to section. And I think that there's kind of this interesting, um, you know, interesting thing that as we, some of us start to think about our thinking tools or um, our power tools or those things, how do you build power tools into a way that has both a kind of a 
process logic if somebody wants to read it front to back, but also has internal links, right? Um, and I, you know, I can show you that under, in, you know, there's like improving your sensing capabilities. Um, then there, there are things you can do around perceptive listening. There's activities that you can do where, um, like I can, you can listen to this thing and, and listen to this cello suite and talk about perceptive listening or visual thinking strategies, which are really powerful, but you can actually apply them to, you know, different pieces of work. So it's really about moving, um, moving kind of knowledge objects, right? Which we're building in, you're building in, in like places like the brain or obsidian that create knowledge webs. And then it's about, you know, turning those things into learning experiences that allow other people to engage them. So this is the pathing stuff, Jerry, that you're talking about. Um, and, you know, how do you build it in a way that people that aren't really familiar with this stuff can get into it, but then layer on additional complexity and you can put links from one place to another and, and really build this, you know, pretty intricate kind of experience. So I'm, I'm excited about where, where it goes. Do they pitch it as an LMS or what, what, what's the framing around our it, 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 They pitch it, they pitch it as a learning experience platform mm -hmm. that you can actually integrate with your LMS. So in a corporation, you might have an LMS, you jump into this. So it's a, it's a learning microsite is mm -hmm. what you're building, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know, whether you break it up into different pieces and then your LMS drops into different learning microsites. So this one is particularly on how do you influence change, right? There may be things which are, you know, how do you think more critically? And, you know, and then there may be links between, you know, between things that you use, you know, something like an obsidian where, where you can, you can network through something, but then when you get to a point where you want to go into a learning experience, not just a reading experience, that you move into something that um, um, you know plays that way. Um, mm -hmm. The um, yeah, I can release the URL right now. I, I got to just talk about it. It's a it's per, I built it for a client, so I have to just make sure you know that um, I'm okay. stripping about all the client information out of there, and we're going to create kind of these generic versions. Um, mm -hmm. But George um, and you know um, and Scott and anybody else. I think that there's an opportunity. Now I have designers and creative thinkers that can start translating content into these types of form factors to make them more readable. And you can put anything in there. You can put video clips. I can put audio clips on each one of these things where we could have, you could be talking over it. You know, these cubes, Scott, I mean, maybe you, you know, we think about your system and how it works that you turn, you know, you can turn cubes into digital experience. I like, so I have coders and stuff that are working on this stuff. So this is this is the thing that I'm I'm really excited about right now is and that the translation process. The platform is rise.com, R I S E dot com. Is that right? Rise is Rise is the name of it, but it's um um yeah. Let me just Yeah, if you can just give us the, the platform uh, URL, that'd be that'd be helpful. Just um, to yes. figure out what, what the tool is. Um and it and I will I will um it's articulate. Rise.com by Articulate. Um, and I will just actually cool. Thank you. Copy this and post it here. Right. But it's um, you know, it you know, it takes a little bit of um, development, but you can you can do so much. And it's almost like what happened with, you know, when all of these web web builder programs, simple web builder programs came online where you know, Squarespace, you can build your own website and without a lot of help. This is you can build your own learning experiences and um, and then just by working with my designer, she can do she can do quite amazing things. Um, so happy to happy to start to add to this body of knowledge in in publishable experiences. Oh, I, I knew I would get you excited, Scott. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I I'm not even gonna say anything because it's all body language for me. All right, we're we'll, we'll we'll get that going. And George, maybe we find some time too. And and it's absolutely fabulous. And cool. Scott, it doesn't hurt that I'm a designer. Right. So I already have that. Yeah. <laughs> I've got all my content. This is this is just 
Good. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you. Briefly, before going to Lauren, Scott, you since you have physical cubes, have you explored all augmented reality as a way of taking a picking up a cube and saying and having something show up around it or or whatever else? Um, the, the cubes are the cubes that I purchased are, are known as universal uh, thinking manipulatives, and it's you know it's the basic structure that you're actually touching and, and all the things that happen when you're doing that and. Uh, I understand the interest in that, but to me, any virtual experience I've ever used like that is it, it, it's clunky. Um, yeah, and Scott, what we've what we've what we're doing is we're actually um, for some of our programs we're sending everybody like a kit, kind of like pitch, picture pages. So you send them that kit, and then you show them the thing. Ooh, what do you what do you got there, Julian? Yeah, <laughs> Julian's like, got something. It's like that thing is connected to the future and the past. So this is related to what was just brought up. And um, I forget, this is called a merge cube. And the idea is there's, you see there's patterns on each face. And as you show it to your phone, your device, right? It brings up a different um, learning experience according. But the thing is, this is a mobile, right? So you can move it around. That becomes part of the experience so that you're actually viscerally, inter viscerally interacting with your virtual experience. And all you need is a phone. You don't need an AR headset for this one. This should be a different experience where they barcode up a cat and you have to hold the cat up at the right angle to the camera to figure out what the next experience is. Wouldn't that be cool? What's that called, Julian? Yeah. What, what's what's uh, that called again? Merge cat. Merge cube. Merge cube. Um, Lauren, you wanted to post it. Yeah. I, I'm looking at it and it, this thing looks awesome. So you're saying you can actually hold an object in virtual space by holding a physical object in real space. Oh, yeah. Oh, geez, this thing is awesome. The, that concept's been around for a while, except, but the cost has gone from a couple million dollars now to just your phone. So. Yeah, it's nice when that happens. Uh, Lauren, jump in. Uh, I'm sorry, did anyone get my link? Is there like a technical problem? Which link? The link I put, I, I said something and I posted the link. No one responded. No I did. One, I'm sorry. I and, just responded. I responded. Was the link in where? The air table. In that chat? Are you talking um, about the I air went table? to the air table, saw a form, and came back to the conversation, Lauren. OK, I mean, I, I was just wondering, I got to talk for one minute. No one bothered to fill out my form. And then someone started talking. Um, and then it was done. Like, so I apologize. Right, there was some every glitch. Week. Some glitch. Come on, guys. Uh, Lauren, I'm sorry. I went and saw a form and I'm like, I'm hosting a, hosting a conversation, can't actually fill out a form right now. We'll come back to it. It's one of the like dozen open tabs from the call. And I thought you were done checking in. Would you like to continue? I just wanted you to fill out my form because I was thinking this might be a way to um, wrap the calls and notice what people are doing. Say if they're deeply listening to uh, other people on the call. So I missed that entirely. So you're saying as a form of gratitude at the end of a call to use a form like this and just drop in what went well on the call in the form. Yes. I missed that entirely. I apologize. Um, and Ken apparently did fill it out and the rest of us uh, could do that as well. What I'm trying to do is get feedback on this form. I mean, maybe it sucks. Uh, maybe there's some, I, I just wanted to see if this is a way that we could start um, Basically, it doesn't suck. the behavior that we want. To do a gentler form of the dot collector. Yes. The, the dot collector, the dot, dot, the dot collector is really in your face. It's like everybody sees everything about everybody. It's a very like you know glass glass walled office kind of thing, and so I like I like an attempt to soften, uh, but get you know get try to get similar effects but soften it. Lauren, did you did you create all the um, attributes in there yourself? Yeah. I want to appreciate you for that. I think it's a, a lovely go. start. And um, I did fill it out. I, it took me a few minutes because there was so much going on in the call. So I found like, okay, there's too much going on. I want to fill this up before the end of the call. So I did go in and, and um, do an appreciation, but it's, I think it's really um, uh, a great beginning. Thank you. What if we made it a weekly version of the Pete Kaminsky Award, but who is doing the stuff that's <laughs> most immediately practically useful to everybody? Mm -hmm. That'd be good. The, the award could be a little um, 
3D printed bust of, of Pete with the headset he yeah, has on right now. There's not a Kaminsky bobblehead, but you know you, you can get those made. Totally, I, I'm I'm pretty sure we can manufacture awesome. this in China and get it shipped out or hmm. locally printed. But it has to be it has to be compostable material. It can't be made out of plastic that goes in the landfill. Actually, it's a seed bomb. And if you plant it in your backyard, <laughs> if you plant it in your backyard, Indra's web, Indra's net grows from it. It's pretty cool. And, and then on the flip side of Kevin's, which I think is absolutely great, the Pete Kaminsky uh, Award every week, there's also the rabbit hole, the positive rabbit hole award, which is the subject that you end up, think you're going to end up spending the rest of the day <laughs> now looking at because it's just so rich and you're so grateful for it. So I'm going to go now as we wrap the call and fill out the form myself. Um, Lauren, thank you for putting that back in. Um, sorry, I screwed that up. Anyone with any closing words for this call? Because we're over time. We're good. Then let's wrap this one. Thank you very much. Um, truly appreciate your being here. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. Until soon. Yeah, stay safe indeed.